Transmitter device activated. Coordinate set for Earth 2. Hey everyone, welcome to the Earth 2 podcast, the podcast where we explore the origins and development of the DC multiverse and the legacy of Golden Age characters throughout the Silver and Bronze Ages of comics. I'm Peter. And I'm David. Welcome back. And today we're staying in the summer of 1963. Yes. We're doing a story from issue 43 of Superman's Girlfriend, Lois Lane. This is from a comic that was only published a week after part one of the recent Justice League, Justice's Act two-parter that we did. So, you know, just bear that in mind. It's all good. Parallel Earths were obviously quite zeitgeisty yes. for a few weeks during that summer. We have a wonderful cover featuring Lois Lane, volunteer nurse. We have uh, Lois Lane looking after uh, a man called Paul, who appears to be in some sort of iron lung or MRI, MRI machine or something. Yeah. And saying, Paul, my darling, as soon as you recover from your operation, we'll be married. You're the first man I've ever known who could make me forget Superman. Lois is dressed as a nurse, of course. And Superman walks in and is thinking... Shades of Ben Casey and Dr. Kildare. Lois has fallen in love with her war hero patient. I've lost her for good. And that's not the story we're doing today. No, there are no. more than one story in this comic. Yep. The good thing about the sort of value about the sort of Silver Age titles was that, um, you know, you maybe got two or three features or two or three stories in the same book. Yes. Not so much in The Flash, occasionally in The Flash, but maybe more so in stuff like, you know, World's Finest or Lois Lane or Jimmy Olsen, that sort of it's stuff. It's definitely got it in, in early Flash a lot, yeah, but, uh, yeah. but it, it petered out quite quickly. Yeah. So, no, the story we're, we're doing is called The Girl Who Mourned for Superman. It's script by Leo Dorfman, art by Kurt Schaffenberger, who's a fantastic artist, do a yes. lot of the revived Shazam stuff. It's, I mean, it's actually, for something in 1963, it has a real sort of fresh, real clean quality to it, which I really like. I'm reading from the reprint in issue 113 of Lois Lane, and Pete's reading from the original. In the reprint, there are, there are a few sort of colouring differences, kind of similar to other things we've, we've mentioned before, but we'll we'll talk about the main ones as we go along. They're, they're not, they don't get in the way of the story in any shape or form, but, but they're very interesting to, to note nonetheless. Mm -hmm. So the splash page, we've actually got three panels in splash page. The intro caption for this one says, We all know Lois Lane idolises Superman for years. The gallant girl reporter has worshipped the Man of Steel, cherishing the dream that someday she would become... Mrs. Superman. But one grim day, Lois' visions of happiness are shattered by heartbreak and sorrow, as destiny decrees that Lois must become the girl who mourns Superman. Yes, and in this uh, panel we have Lois, uh, all in black, in mourning, crying over some sort of mantle shrine yes, yes, to mantle Superman. Piece, yeah. There's a picture of him on the wall, there's a, a wreath there, a couple of candles, and there's a bow round the wreath saying, rest in peace, my beloved... <laughs> Uh, and we've got a lovely Kurt Schaffenberger signature there. Now, there are a couple of differences between this and the uh, reprint. The original has got a yellow wall background. Yeah, but in the reprint, it's a sort of slightly earthy brown. Mm -hmm. It's been tweaked slightly so you can see where the candles are kind of casting a glow. Yeah. And interestingly, the Kurt Schaffenberger signature is missing from the reprint, and there's a ah. caption telling you that it's from Lois Lane issue 43, so that's quite interesting. There you go. And less interestingly, there's a lampshade which is sort of Purple, purple in mm -hmm. the original, yeah. but it's a sort of pale blue. So again, makes me think from what we were saying about that Justice League story the other week. I wonder if there maybe were they just reprinted from black and white Neither stats and, and recolored, or you know, entirely, yeah. it's interesting. Could be. It's interesting to consider. I think it's interesting to consider. You may disagree. Let us know. <laughs> Lois, we should say, has some dialogue in this opening panel. She knows the tears, you know, are streaming from her face, and she has a handkerchief up to her mouth, and she's saying, "Sob, oh Superman, my dearest, your dying wish was that I forget you and marry someone else." But I can't erase your memory. Though you are dead, you're enshrined in my heart forever. Into the story proper. One stormy day, as reporter Lois Lane hurries to the planet office, she meets the Jimmy Olsen fan club. And it is indeed a stormy day. It's, the rain's coming down in torrents. Lois is there. Lots of dark clouds. Yes. Yep. Lois is there wearing a headscarf. And we see three young boys holding a, a red kite. Uh, one of the boys has a pith helmet on. Must be some Isn't that, it's maybe kind of just adventure. sort of rain. So it's interesting that he, he has a sort of hat on, but the other two don't. They're yeah. obviously not too fussed, but their crew cuts getting... He must be the leader. Yes. <laughs> and also he's the only one with dialogue, and he says, Hi, Miss Lane. Jimmy promised to demonstrate how Benjamin Franklin used a kite to get electricity from lightning. But he hasn't shown up yet. And Lois is considering, and she says, Hmm, perhaps I can help. I still remember my electricity from the physics course I took in college. And the next panel, the caption says, In a nearby vacant lot, Lois performs a foolhardy experiment. And we see Lois is flying the kite. Now, the kite in the original <laughs> is coloured red. 
Yes, in the reprint, it's white. Uh-huh. And in the original, Lucy raincoat is white, whereas it's been given a sort of yellow shade in the reprint. Okay. There we are. Mm. So she's flying the kite up in the middle of this storm. There's lightning cracking down. And one of the Jimmy's fan club says, uh, Lois, maybe this is a little risky. And Lois says, nonsense. When that lightning strikes the kite, the electricity will travel down the wet string and emerge from that metal key. And we can see right enough, yes, there's a key on the string. Which halfway is, down the yep, string. Halfway down yes. the string. So moving on to page two, and we have a caption which reads, but as lightning strikes the kite, a colourful figure flies in out of nowhere. And we see the kite has indeed been struck by lightning, and Superman has grabbed the string that uh, Lois is flying it with, and absorbing all the electricity, and with a big zap sound effect, and one of the boys is saying, it's Superman, he grabbed the kite string and absorbed the electric charge from that thunderbolt. Mm Mm-hmm. And on to the next panel, Superman's landed and is berating Lois, saying, of all the hairbrain stunts, if I hadn't grounded that lightning charge, you would have been electrocuted. Luckily, I was watching you with my telescopic vision. And the boy with the pith helmet on says, don't blame her, Superman. She was only trying to help us duplicate Ben Franklin's famous experiments. And the next panel, Superman flies off, saying, that crude experiment could have cost you your life, Lois. For Pete's sake, try to stay out of trouble. (laughs) For your sake. For my sake. Yeah. And Lois says, I promise not to be so careless, Superman. And she thinks to herself, sigh, in spite of his scolding, I'm sure he loves me. Or he wouldn't come to my assistance whenever I'm in trouble. And the next panel? Yep. Um, Caption says, later at the office of the Daily Planet, Lois is greeted by the editor, Perry White. Uh, Perry sitting behind his desk saying, Lois, aren't you supposed to be on vacation? I thought that by now you'd be up in that new bungalow you bought at Pine Lake. And Lois says, you've got it all mixed up, Perry. I'm going up there next week. Well... What's cooking? I'm ready for an assignment. And Perry says the Queen of Morvania is arriving at Metropolis Airport this morning. If you take the helicopter, you can get there in time for an interview, Lois. And indeed, we see the helicopter on the roof of the Daily Planet building. Yeah, it's it's interesting because it looks like, you know, the sun's coming out from behind the clouds a little bit as the storm sort of clears up. I quite like that sort of touch. Um, A big fan of Schaefenberger, I must say. Mm -hmm. And Lois's reply to Perry is, I'm on my way. Now that the storm is over, indeed, I shouldn't have any trouble getting to the airport in that whirly bird. And the caption for the next panel says, but as Lois enters the helicopter... We see the helicopter take off from the top of the Daily Planet building, but there seems to be some kind of glass sphere hovering above it, and it seems to be drawing the helicopter into it. And Lois thinks to herself, good grief, what's going on here? The helicopter is being lifted up by some powerful magnetic force. It's heading straight for the opening of that giant glass bowl. I'm not sure how she knows it's a magnetic force. Hmm... We move on to page three, and the caption says, Trapped in the giant glass bowl, Lois is carried seaward by a mysterious force. And we see... The helicopter within the glass bowl uh, floating towards a mysterious island yep. out in the middle of the ocean. Indeed, and Lois again thinks, Gulp, what goes on here? I'm being carried toward that distant island. Presently, as Lois descends... We see on the shore of the island, we have, oh, it's our old favourite, it's Lex Luthor. He's there with a lovely bank of computers and uh, he's got a big radar dish equipment array that is controlling the glass sphere. And he says, Welcome, Miss Lane. This is Lex Luthor. I've taken over electronic control of your helicopter radio. You can communicate only with me. And Lois thinks, Oh, it's Luthor, the world's greatest criminal genius and Superman's sworn enemy. And then she shouts, But Luthor, I thought you were in prison. And Luthor, in close up, uh, radios back to her. I built a robot to take my place and escaped here to Vengeance Island. Vengeance Island. Wow. Here, I built this remote control bowl, which captured you. And we hear Lois's message back to him. Luther, you're a fool. When Superman discovers I'm your prisoner, he'll come here and free me. And at this point, we should probably point out, this is Silver Age, slightly overweight, baldy... Prison fatigue, sort of grey overall. Lex Luthor, yeah, yeah. yeah. You saw him in that outfit quite often, didn't you? Yeah, oh, up until you've got the purple the, leotard. I can't sort of wait thing. for the, the purple and green suit, man. That's going to be amazing. That's great stuff. So Lex continues. He points at some equipment behind him and says, That's just what I'm counting on. You're the bait in my trap. Miss Lane, permit me to show you my latest invention. This three-dimensional projector, which will help me destroy Superman. And he's pointing at two giant lenses on... Yeah, a, I mean, they kind of look like, you know... Telescope lenses are they're kind of mounted on... On a plinth. Yeah, and, and springs and hinged and, and all that sort of stuff. And the original it's coloured red. But on the, the reprint, it's coloured blue. Yeah, I mean, the colouring across the board, actually, in the reprint is a little bit more subtle. There's a panel where it looks like Lexi's suit is a little bluer rather than the sort of yeah. fatigues. But it's interesting because in the original, both the equipment 
and the helicopter are red. So in the reprint, they've coloured them differently, which actually works a little better. There's some, yeah. I think we'll maybe post on the socials. I think the, we'll post the bottom panel of page three, both uh-huh. versions of that, because that will give you a, a better sort of sense of how different they look. Absolutely. After Lex shouts that up to Lois, um, Lois, we, we see off off camera, we can we see Lois's thought bubble, and she's saying, "Gulp." Luther looks so self confident. I wonder what fiendish scheme he's thought up this time. And then we get to the bottom of the page, and we have the. Trapped helicopter being brought in by one of the lenses, and the other lens is projecting an image of it back up into the sky. Yep, and Lois is shouting down, Very clever. By focusing the projector, you've created a 3D image of me in that other bowl. How will that help trap Superman? We shall see. (laughs) Haha, don't underestimate my genius, Miss Lane. So, we move on to page four, and the caption says, Presently, as Luther's challenge echoes over the world's airways, So, we have... Superman flying in the sky and he's flying past uh, a jumbo jet just going by. Superman hears uh, from the jumbo jet a radio signal saying, Attention, Superman, wherever you are, this is Luthor. I've captured Lois Lane. Rescue her if you dare. And Superman thinks that broadcast is coming from that passing plane. That means Lex Luthor has escaped and is threatening Lois to get back (laughs) at me. I must save her. That's the most laid-back Superman ever. He's pretty chill, isn't he? Yes. <laughs> Amazing. So the caption for the second panel on top of page four, guided by his telescopic vision, Superman locates the island and... Very quickly, very quickly he located this island from mm. flying about, mm. uh, picking up a radio signal. He's there right in the next panel, no mm. messing about. So Superman's flying down into a crater uh, in the island and he sees the helicopter trapped within a glass bowl and indeed he thinks... There's Lois now. She's trapped in some kind of glass bowl in the middle of that crater. But Luther's evil eyes are watching. And we see Lex Luthor with a kind of a detonator mm. hidden mm. off to the side. What colour's your detonator? Uh, brown. Oh, mine is red. Okay. Uh, and he's uh, saying, <laughs> The fool doesn't realise he's seeing an image, not the real Lois. He's walking right into my trap. The crater is mined with a dozen bombs loaded with liquefied kryptonite. <gasps> Yep, so Lex presses down on the detonator, obviously, because in the, the caption for the next panel is, as the fiendish Luthor triggers the blast, we have a massive BOOM! And we see Superman standing in the crater, and there's eruptions of liquid kryptonite everywhere. And off panel, Lex's voice can be heard saying, Die, Superman! Die! Which is German for the Superman the... Interesting. Yeah. Hmm. I wonder if any German readers were confused. Maybe. Possibly. What's German for die, then? The hmm. So the caption of the next panel says, "But the powerful blast has torn loose several boulders, and and we see Luther trapped underneath a pile oh, of rubble, no. uh, and he's going, boulders got me, but I don't care. Worth it if I killed Superman." And in the background, we see what looks like possibly the corpse of Superman lying in a puddle of green kryptonite, liquid kryptonite. Yeah. Caption for the next panel says, "Meanwhile." The flying debris has shattered Lois Glass Prison. Is that like a maybe a bit of gas or something sort of? Yeah, still so, some vapor some coming off of the. And Lois has her hands to her face and she's saying, "Superman, he flew straight into Luther's trap." Oh no, no! Over the page to page five. Anguished moments later. And indeed, we have Superman. He's not. He's not dead yet. He is still lying on the pool of liquefied kryptonite. And Lois is running forward to his aid. And she says, "Superman, that bomb injured him." I must get help. And Superman says, Lois, thank heavens you're safe. And beyond help, Luther has finished me. <laughs> and the next panel, Lois has reached Superman and she's sort of, she's humped him up on her knee. Yeah, she has him in her arms, cradled in her arms. Yeah, and she says, Superman, you can't die. The world needs you. If criminals and evil doers find out, choke. And Superman says, no one must know of my death, Lois. The people of Kandor have been observing me. Even now, they are choosing the one who will replace me. Till then, your lips must be sealed. Meanwhile, a robot will pinch it for me. Lois, darling, I'm going fast. Must say it now, I've always loved you, but you must forget me. Promise me you'll marry someone else. It's my dying wish. And Superman is now completely green by this point. Yes. It's quite effective in the original because the background panel is sort of red. Yeah. It's red, but it's just a sort of yellow. Yellow. And and also Lois's coat 
in the reprint is white, whereas in the original it's purple. Mm -hmm. We're kind of spoiling some of the the drama, the pathos. The drama and the pathos so here. much for pathos. So much, for, so much for pathos. And Lois says, "So I promise, my darling, and now a last kiss, choke, before we part." And she thinks to herself, "Sob, oh my dearest, I had such hopes, such dreams, and now they're over forever." And it's very interesting here that they haven't called Superman in the reprint. They haven't called Superman's suit in. It's well, just it's a, it's a completely white panel, white. more or less, with Lois's oh, white bizarre. coat and Superman in the background. It's it's quite weird. So now at the bottom of the panels on page five, and the caption says, "Soon as the Superman emergency squad of Candor bears away the departed hero." Now we'll just read the panel first, then we'll go into a bit of detail and a bit of background about some of the characters in it. We have on the beach. Lois crying. We have a grave uh, that says, Here lies Lex Luthor, evildoer, slayer of Superman. Oh, interesting. And we have the corpse of Superman being flown away by tiny super people. One of them saying, Farewell, Lois. We'll build him a monument in space. His fame will live forever. And Lois, through her tears, says, Farewell, Superman. So it's our last goodbye, my darling. So, Pete, very quickly, Candor. Candor, right. We haven't come across Kandor yet in these stories. Kandor is a surviving city of Krypton. There was a, a villain called Brainiac who was a bit of a collector. And he used to go around from planet to planet and collect a sample city or a sample of the population from each planet. And he did so by using a shrinking ray. And basically he shrunk down a city. Uh, and the city he chose was Kandor. And he took it away with him. And the people of Krypton were powerless to stop him. And he decided to, to his collection and went about his business. He came across Superman a couple of times. Superman managed to rescue the bottle city of Kandor, but he never found a way to bring it back. Well, at this stage, he never found a way to bring it back to its full size. Mm -hmm. So, Do, yes... Am I right in thinking it sort of lives in his fortress of solitude? It's currently... Well, at, yeah. at the time of this story, it's yeah. in its fortress of solitude being protected there. Mm -hmm. There were stories in which he would go into it and have adventures there, or Kandorians could come out and have adventures. And, indeed, there was a Superman emergency squad that was based in Kandor that would uh, occasionally help uh, with some of his adventures. Uh, interestingly enough, the character Nightwing that Dick Grayson became uh, in comics after he was Robin was originally the secret identity of a superhero in Kandor, which mm -hmm. uh, was Clark Kent. Yeah, the, cause, and Jimmy Olsen was Flamebird. He was Flamebird, yes. And in the 70s, in the Superman family title, there was a sort of regular series of Nightwing and Flamebird, but I believe by that point it was just a couple of lads from Kandor. It wasn't actually Clark and Jimmy. Yeah. At that point, but I like. I've always. I'm sure there's a story which made a point of mentioning the fact that Dick did that deliberately. And indeed, there was a legacy flame bird as well because uh, that was the original Bat Girl, not Bat Girl, but Bat Girl. Two words. Uh, she took on the identity of flame bird later on as well. Interesting. So there you go, folks. So back to the plot. However, back to the plot. Yes. Heartbroken, Lois flies back to Metropolis. And the helicopter is landed back on the planet's uh, roof, and Perry meets her there and says. I know, Lois, because of the storm, the Queen of Marvania landed at another airport. A bad break. It could have been a big story. And Lois says, I'm sorry, Perry. And she thinks, what irony. I have the biggest scoop of all time, but I gave my word not to tell anyone about it. And so she, obviously she Perry's... Looks, she looks utterly uh, distraught. Yeah, Japan Perry well. obviously hasn't realised that, that the helicopter was captured by Luthor and all that sort of yeah. stuff. And so which, yeah, Which begs the question, did Lois fly the helicopter herself? I think she must have done because there was nobody else on that little mm -hmm. island okay. and all the stuff was happening there. Moving on to page six and the caption at the top says, Later in the Daily Planet office, Jimmy Olsen uses his supersonic watch to signal Superman. And we have in the newsroom, Jimmy and Lois both there and Jimmy's watch is going off and coming through the window is Superman. And Jimmy says... Superman, it's vital you deliver this anti-rabies serum to the medical centre at once. Lois thinks, Gulp, for a minute my heart stopped. I thought it was the real Superman. Jimmy doesn't know it, but that's a robot he's talking to. But Jimmy notices something wrong in Lois's attitude. And Jimmy says, Lois, you're always so thrilled to see Superman, yet now you're practically ignoring him. Aren't you going to say hello? And Lois says, uh, Hello Superman, I'm a little busy right now. And she thinks, I'll have to force a smile. Can't let Jimmy suspect the bitter truth. Now, I love the fact that there's a rabies vaccine in a jar with a label on it. Just, yeah, you know, in the Daily Planet office. Hanging around the Daily Planet newsroom. Makes, but of course it is. You know, it's not like, you know, 
Yeah. They got Superman to go to the laboratory. I, I wonder if there's a story in Jimmy Olsen where he got hold of the rabies vaccine with a lovely Kurt Swan rabid infected animals, that sort of stuff. Could you be. can imagine. I can't imagine that really being a story at all. <laughs> And the story continues with the caption saying, but there's more torment in store for Lois. And we have Perry White cornering Lois outside the file room and says, Lois, this was Clark's assignment, but he didn't show up today. The Vardor Galaxy wants some information about Superman for their history books. Will you check the files to find out what his greatest deeds were? The Vardor Galaxy? That's so random. Okay, and Lois says, I'll get right on it, Perry, and thinks, I don't need those files. Superman's heroic deeds are all engraved in my heart forever. And then we have uh, some flashback panels here. The first one is Superman and Lois in an Arctic landscape. Superman's fighting ice giants. Yeah, so it's zapping with his heat vision. And we see Lois thinking about this little flashback bubble. And she thinks, I still remember how he used his heat vision to defend me when the ice people emerged from that Arctic glacier. And then we have another flashback panel. And Lois's thought process is... Then there was the time when he absorbed the war of the brain worlds by absorbing their super energy bolts and disarming them. I love this. It's amazing, isn't this, it? This, if Grant Morrison was reading this, we'd be all about this. Basically, it's two giant glass spheres in space with giant brains in them with tendrils and things coming out of them. One big giant brain in each. Uh, and there's kind of lightning blasts coming out of both hitting Superman. This is insane. <laughs> You've got like Saturn-like planets in the background. Yep. We're definitely putting this that panel up. The socials. It's phenomenal. Brain worlds. I, lo- <laughs> I mean, I love in the Silver Age how they just do casual throw yeah, I mean, stuff like exactly. this. Exactly. I mean, in the panel, cut panels before that, Perry's saying, the Vardor Galaxy wants some information. Is the Vardor Galaxy, is that an actual galaxy or is that a newspaper? I don't know. The Vardor Galaxy, I mean, it makes me, at first I thought it would be another galaxy. It's too early for galaxy communications in mm. Superman titles. But the Vardor Galaxy wants some information like about Superman for the history books. Who are these aliens from the Vardor Galaxy? How did they get in touch? How is Perry involved? Mm-hmm. Was the rabies vaccine related at the same time? Yeah. I don't know. I don't know if there was. Probably uh, not. I don't know if this, there actually was a story with the brain worlds in it. Usually there's an editor's note if there was. Mm-hmm. I honestly don't know offhand. If you do, know yourself. Listener, then please let us know. Absolutely. But uh, it's a fantastic concept. And as I said, it's just one panel these days. That's a six-issue maxi-series. That's the thing. I was just sort of thinking, like, earlier on when Superman flew out in the crater, you know, nowadays Bendis would string that out to six pages of dialogue as he flew around the world and thought about stuff. But anyway. And then we come out with flashbacks and Lois is looking at a photo of Superman yes. with a tear in her eye. She's yeah. thinking, oh. oh, my darling, you'll never do any more of your magnificent super deeds. Don't worry, I'll wipe my tears away. No one will discover the truth from me. And we move on to page seven, and we're basically back to the opening splash panel. Yes. But that night, Lois mourns in the solitude of her room. And, and we've it's... got that shrine that we, we talked about in the first panel. Yeah. And Lois is saying, forgive me, Superman. I know I promised to forget you. Promised to find another love. I'm trying so hard. So hard. So life moves on for Lois. The caption for the next panel says, attempting to keep her promise, Lois dates a new suitor and... Is this Lois Lane's sister Lucy for the first time in this podcast? This is Lucy Lane, yes. Terrific. Blonde Lucy Lane here. We have uh, Lucy and Lois uh, talking to each other as, as Lois is about to walk into another room where we see the back of her suitor. Mm-hmm. We do not see what he looks like properly yet. And Lucy's saying, So, you're two-timing Superman by dating that handsome UN delegate, eh? I don't <laughs> blame you, Lois, after the way Superman's been neglecting you lately. And Lois says, Girl's got to have some fun, Lucy. But Lois is thinking to herself, Choke. Her words are a knife in my heart. But my sister Lucy doesn't realise that Superman is dead. Later, attending a party at the United Nations, Lois is the belle of the evening. And we have a small montage of Lois dancing with several of the guests at the UN evening. And the first one is a Duke. He's a tall chap from Black Tails with a fashionable facial hair. And he says, My lovely one, you have but to say the word and my dukedom is at your feet. And... The other chap, we later learn, is a Raja, and he's saying to Lois, marry me, beautiful Lois, and become the Rani of Mahadori. <laughs> I think that's how you pronounce it. Let's assume. But suddenly Lois finds herself alone, and she thinks to herself, nobody's asking me to dance. They're all whispering and staring at me. The Raja had the next number with me. I'll ask him what this is all about. And we see in the background. Some of the delegates uh, chatting, and they're just looking at her with, she, with yeah. suspicion. Mm. And as the Raja explains... It is easy to understand why no one asks you to dance, my dear. They have heard the rumour that you are Superman's sweetheart. Nobody can fight that kind of competition. And Lois thinks, thank you, Raja. And now if you'll excuse me, choke, she thinks, even if I want to forget Superman. 
they won't let me. It's interesting you think choke. Yeah, yeah, that is, is definitely in the thought panel, but yeah. choke's usually you know, a, mm-hmm. a vocal thing. It's not something you usually think. But a few moments later, a stranger enters the hall and... Permit me to introduce myself. I am the ambassador from Atlantis. May I have this dance? Wow, he's a, he's a suave looking cookie, isn't he? he is. Great temples and, you know, uh-huh. clean limbs and very tall, straight back. And Lois says, I, I'd be delighted. And she thinks, I've got to get hold of myself. He said he was from Atlantis, but of course that's impossible. Puzzled, Lois questions her partner and, The ambassador from Atlantis? You're joking, of course. And she thinks, Atlantis sank beneath the sea ages ago. These people are mermen and mermaids. Come now, my dear. Every child knows about Atlantis. Why? Columbus stopped there on his way to discover the new world. Presently, in the lobby of the hall. And they've finished their dance. Mm -hmm. And they're standing beside a giant globe. The ambassador continues. There you are, my dear. I'm afraid you know little of geography. And Lois, she looks very stunned. And she thinks, Atlantis on the map. It's impossible. I've got to check on this. Excuse me, Mr. Ambassador, but I must leave now. And right enough, I mean, it's a globe. They're suddenly looking at a globe and there's a big landmass between Africa and the Americas. It's um interesting. So, in the nearby United Nations Library, Lois discovers, and we see her basically looking at a big book. And we should mention, of course, that in the reprint here, Lois's dress is sort of yellow and black, but in the original it's quite sort of pale blue. So there we go, there's a little bit of a difference for you. And Lois thinks to herself as she reads through this book, here it is in this encyclopedia, Atlantis, an island continent. Ancient culture survived a disastrous flood. Population 30 million? Is this some kind of joke? No, wait. I just remembered something. And the next panel, and Lois is having a, a flashback sort of memory, and the, you know, the Lois who's narrating the flashback panel says, Yes, there was that strange remark Perry made to me a few days ago. And in the body of the flashback, Perry says, Lois, aren't you supposed to be on your vacation? I thought that by now you'd be up on that new bungalow you bought up in Pine Lake. And Lois is saying to Perry, You've got it all mixed up, Perry. I'm going there next week. So that's basically just a a retread of what we had earlier on. So we cut back to Lois in the present and she looks very shocked and she's thinking to herself, Perry would never have made a mistake like that unless, yes, it all fits in with this strange world history I see here. Somehow, and here we are, listeners, somehow I must have slipped through an unseen barrier into a parallel universe. This planet is an exact twin of the one I really live in and the Superman and Luther who died are twins of the ones I know on my Earth. Great grief. I just realised... There must be another Lois in this parallel world, a duplicate of myself. Choke, she thinks. I must see her and tell her what happened. The next morning, as a car arrives at a mountain resort... And did we see the car outside a cabin? What was that cabin? A lakeshore cabin? Mm, nice. Yeah, very nice. Although it's, it's raining, it's not, yeah. not the nicest of days. Yeah, I, th- I wonder if the rain's going to be significant. We'll find out. Yeah, and Lois, she's got out of her car and she's walking towards the building and she's thinking, there it is, gulp. That little bungalow is the exact duplicate of the one I bought in my own world. If my guess is right, my twin Lois is around here too. And she enters the cabin of the bungalow. Very fetching headscarf on, yeah, although but some... again, there's a difference in the, the raincoats. Yeah, in the reprint, the raincoat is yellow. In the original, it's white. In the reprint, the curtains are white. In the original, they're green. And the lampshade is purple in the original and pale blue in the reprint. And the couch is a sort of bright orangey red in the original and a sort of more muted brown in the reprint. Wow. Basically, what we're trying to say is... This is content. It has totally, totally been recolored. Yes. So there we are. So Lois enters the, the bungalow and she thinks to herself, the door's open, no one's inside. I guess the other Lois must have gone swimming before the rain started. I'll just slip in and look around. So she does so and she enters a room that has got lots of Superman memorabilia yeah. in it. And uh, there's a typewriter there, there's a chest of drawers, lots of pictures on the wall of Superman. Superman. Yep. Mm-hmm. And she picked up a piece of paper and she's thinking, gasp, it's furnished exactly like my own bungalow, souvenirs... Pictures of Superman. Even the electric typewriter is just like mine. And this other Lois is writing Superman's life story, just as I planned to do it. I have to say, man, Lois, having all these pictures of him on the wall, it's not a good look. That's just going to scare him off. But I bet she wasn't planning to invite Superman up to this cabin at any point, or, you know, or she maybe wouldn't let him in. Maybe the room's been painted in lead line paint <laughs> so that you won't see all the... It may well be. It's like that Alan Partridge episode. Yes, it is. <laughs> You're a mentalist. It reminds me a bit of a teenage girl bedroom sort of thing. Yeah. Uh, I mean, that, that's... My sister back when take that were on the go. And yeah, just... it says a lot about the way Lois is sort of characterised back in the day, doesn't it? So anyway, in the next panel, the caption says, but suddenly Lois hears footsteps outside. And I'm through a glass door, a silhouette mm-hmm. approaching, yep. and Lois uh, decides to tuck in behind a curtain to hide. Yep, and she thinks, it's my twin, the Lois Lane who lives in this parallel world. I'd better duck behind this drape or she'll see me. Choking with emotion, the caption for the next panel reads, 
Lois watches her twin turn on the news broadcast. There's a little voice buzzing out the radio and it says, And so the disaster was averted when Superman saved the Hawaiian Islands by freezing the huge tidal wave with his super breath. And the newly arrived Lois exclaims to herself with her hands clasped up to her face, My hero, he's wonderful. Whereas our Lois is hiding behind a curtain and she thinks, Poor kid, she's living in a fool's paradise. She doesn't know that the real Superman's dead and that the super deed was done by a robot. And in the next panel, we see the, the newly arrived Lois obviously going into her bedroom in the bungalow. And our Lois thinks to herself, maybe I ought to tell her the truth. God, by having that heart, I'll just slip out while she's dressing in the bedroom. She is right beside the electric typewriter. Yes. Um, and there's a precariously placed glass of water. Yes, the maze right scene it. is tremendous. Was the, was the, yes, the glass of water was an earlier panel. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But as Lois passes the typewriter. And she's knocked it over. Oh, no. Uh, and it has poured over the electric typewriter and there's a giant zap Yep. sound effect. As a bolt of electricity coils out the typewriter and hits Lois. And Lois says, that glass of water, it's splashed on the electric typewriter. It's going to short circuit. And in the next mad moment, we're now on the top of page 10. What's happening here, Pete? We have a fantastic panel. There's two rainbow whirlwinds, similar to the ones that we saw in Superman 146, Superman's Greatest Feats. That's right. And Lois is falling between the two of them. And she's still clutching the, the pages that she picked up from uh, the other Lois's typewriter. Mm -hmm. And she's thinking, something's happening. I'm being whirled back through time and space. And the caption at the top of the next panel says, an instant later, Lois finds herself in her own world. And she's right back in the storm where she originally left with Superman. Who's admonishing. Yes, <laughs> pointing accusingly. We have got the Jimmy Olsen fan club. And the chap with the pith helmet is like holding out his hand to help her back up. Mm. And Superman says to her, Everything's all right, Lois. You could have been killed by lightning, but I saved you from the results of that foolish experiment by grounding the wet kite string. And yet Lois is on the ground. She's just getting back up from it. She's looking very disorientated and has her hand up to her face. And the pith helmet Jimmy Olsen boy says... It was a risky thing to do, Lois. We shouldn't have allowed it. And the caption for the next panel says, Lois is momentarily confused, but... And Lois is holding up uh, the pages that she took with her from the other world. And she's staring at them. She's looking shocked with her hand up at her face. Yep. Superman's looking over her shoulder. And he, he looks very suspicious, doesn't he? He does, he's actually. Thinking, What's going on here? Yeah, but Lois is thinking to herself, choke. Was it all a dream? A nightmare I had while I was unconscious? No. I still have that typewritten sheet I picked up in that parallel world. The lightning bolt must have created a warp in time and space permitting me to slip through. And a short circuit in that electric typewriter hurled me back again. And in the final panel, Superman's flying off. Yep, but Superman departs and he says to Lois, Goodbye, Lois, and for Pete's sake, try to avoid any more of those harebrained stunts of yours. And Lois, she looks delighted that he's, he's alive and she's back and she says, Goodbye, Superman. And she thinks to herself, Scold me. Say anything you like, my dearest, but at least you're alive in this dimension. I'm so much luckier than that other Lois in the twin world I just left. The, the end. end. That was great fun. Yes. That, that, oh, seriously, Lois Lane stories from this era are just tons of fun and hardly anyone reads them. Hardly anyone rates them. They're just Yeah, I mean, it's, from the point of view of women's sort of representation, you know, she's displayed as being utterly mobile, has her own place and all mm -hmm. that sort of stuff and self-sufficient. Mm -hmm. But the, you know, as you said, like it's a teenage girl's bedroom, the way she sort of pines after Superman is quite... Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, so I'm trying to figure out where exactly earlier in the story she would have been the lightning struck, the, the moment the, the lightning struck. There, the, yeah, the original, the actual transition between worlds initially is very unclear mm. because it does look like Superman absorbs all the electricity. Yeah. So it does seem a bit kind of weird. But once again, it's another case of lightning slash electricity causing wow. dimensional jumps. Yeah. Here's a thought. Right. Superman's case his feet, so obviously we talked about in our earlier episode as well. They used a similar effect with the whole Rainbow Whirlwinds, but also Atlantis was saved in Superman's case his feet. Is this the same world? Ah. Uh -huh. This could possibly be the same world. That's a thought. Uh, I've not really thought about it any further than that. Yeah. But just the fact that Atlantis yeah, does exist. It's possible. It uh, could be. It could yeah. be a callback to that. Although, again, there's no caption box saying yeah. it's, probably, it's probably just coincidental. One thing I do like about this story is, mm -hmm. you know, we're kind of being slightly dismissive there of the way Lois is represented as being sort of a teenage girl. You know, but uh, you, you do really get a, a real sense of her loss. That, yes. you know That she genuinely misses Superman and thinks that he's gone. Mm -hmm. You wonder if the parallel earth Lois ever figured yeah, out or found out. out or, you know, learn yeah. what happened. It's, um... I mean, as far as we know, we don't go back to this earth again. Yeah. And again, we don't know if it's the same earth as the Superman Greatest Feats one. Mm -hmm. Again, it's just, I love how they're playing around with the parallel universe yep. concept. Yep. 
because obviously when we, when we first talked about doing this podcast, we thought it was, we'd just be doing the, the Earth 2 GLA GSA team up sort of stuff. Yeah. But for me, at least, it's interesting seeing the different ways that the DC editorial guys were all thinking, right? Absolutely. How can we play with parallel universes? Mm-hmm. And I'm happy to say there's still a few more to come. Yes. Absolutely. It looks like, uh, you know, if you're in a Julie Schwartz book, then basically it's vibrations. And yes. if you're in a Superman book, then it's all electricity. Yeah. Uh, so, so it's, it's yeah. quite fun. So maybe we should try and set up some sort of experiment where we can try and vibrate as we get struck by lightning and see what happens. Possibly. Let's, yeah, we don't do try that. this at home, kids. No, obviously not. Right. Yeah. So there's not an awful lot of reader response to, to look at for this one, but Pete has dug deep and found it in the letters page of issue 47 yes. of Lois Lane. It is just the one letter that actually refers to this story. And it says, Dear Editor, I believe someone goofed in the story The Girl Who Mourned for Superman. In this tale... How could the Superman Emergency Squad extricate Superman's body from the liquefied kryptonite? When they were from Krypton, asks Robert LaRoche from Westbrook, Maine. And the editor responds, Obviously, the stuff had evaporated by the time they reached the scene. Obviously. And as much as liquid kryptonite is highly volatile, there is no other reference to the story in the uh, letters page, which is a bit disappointing, really. Yeah. For such a cracking story. I should point out similarities to a few elements from Superman's Greatest Feats and the whole electricity struck by lightning thing. Yeah. We're def- you know, we've had that a couple of times. We're going to have it again. We're going to have it again. Very soon. Um, very quickly, before we go, we're going to make mention of a couple of stories that are also reprinted in issue 113 of Lois. There's a story from Lois issue... 54, which is called The Monster Who Loved Lois Lane, and it's about a scientist called Dr. Elder, who built a machine which can penetrate into another dimension, and a monster comes through and gets a bit smitten with Lois. Various hijinks involving trees and flowers and escaped animals and Superman getting punched through a wall, and then the monster gets sent back to its own dimension. And then it got a sequel story a few months later, a few issues later, I should say, called The Return of Lois's Monster Sweetheart when the Monster Sweetheart guy comes back and he's got a girlfriend who takes a bit of a shine for Jimmy and ultimately they get sent back to their own dimension and live happily ever after. Not quite a parallel off, but worth mentioning because it's another dimension. Absolutely, yes. Mentioning dimension. And f- the final thing I want to mention, 113 is not quite an 80-page giant. They're kind of getting phased out by this point, but still a giant size issue. Around at this point was when the 52-page sized issues of DC Comics were happening a lot of time. We'll do... We'll do. We'll pay a lot more attention to them when we actually get to them. Yes. But this one, the backup strips in Lois Lane at the time, or the you know filling out the fifty-two pages, there was a Rose and Thorn strip. But this issue one one three has a couple of pages, and I'll, t- I'll just tell you what the caption says: presenting the original Golden Age Rose and Thorn. Two pages from a Flash story that was never published. Oh. Art by Joe Cooper, and it's basically a couple of panels of Jay Garrick and Joan, who we've met previously in the podcast, and Joan's sort of trapped in us. She calls it a contact bomb. Have you? Do you know the Doctor Who story, Time and the Rani? Yes. Yeah, she's caught in one of those sort of bubbles and basically Jay rescues her from it and Green Lantern turns up for a couple of panels as well, which is quite interesting. And Jay makes mention this could be a problem for the Justice Society of America because there's talk about the Rose and Thorn and blah, blah, blah. And there's a caption there which says, want to see more of the Golden Age Thorn? If so, write and tell us. Meanwhile, watch watch for the new Thorn in every issue of Lois Lane. So that's just quite interesting as a little crossover moment, which mentions as well as Jay, Wonder Woman also gets a mention. But as I say, I'll put those two pages just up in the socials so you can have a look at them. Totally random. I don't remember seeing any other reference to this story anywhere. It might turn up at some point. If so, we'll let you know. Mm -hmm. But yeah, that was a little Golden Age, Jay Garrick and Alan Scott bonus. And that's us. That's it for Lois Lane 43. So that's what we thought about the story. What did you think about it? Please get in touch and let us know. You can email us at theearth2podcast at gmail.com. Make sure you follow us on Facebook, Instagram and Twitter. We're at the Earth 2 Podcast on Facebook and Instagram, and you can find us on Twitter at podcast underscore Earth 2. We'll be putting up lots of comparative pictures for this one, so make sure you follow us so you get all that extra bonus material. Absolutely. So thank you for listening. To join us again next time, we will see you soon on the The Earth Earth 2 Podcast. Transmatter Cube activated. Return coordinate set for Earth Prime. We're at the S2 cost... Cod piece. <laughs> That's our new podcast. <laughs>